The views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Natural Bridges Media or KSQD's staff, volunteers, or underwriters. Welcome to Talk of the Bay. I'm your host, Len B.A., and my guest today is Dan Hayfley. Dan Hayfley is currently a board member for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation and chair of the board for Catamaran Literary Reader. He was the first executive director of Save Our Shores and of O'Neill Sea Odyssey. Dan Hayfley, welcome to Talk of the Bay. Well, it's great to be here with you, Len. Thank you for having me. I want to find out uh, for our listeners as much as we can about the the pending Chumash Heritage uh, Marine Sanctuary, which appears will be a reality in the near future. Uh, but before that, I wanted to ask you to give us some background. Um, we have Monterey Base Marine Sanctuary here, and yeah. there's uh, Channel Island Sanctuary, and there's others... Yeah around the coast now of the United States. How did those come into being and what have we got? Yeah, exactly. It's a really good question. Marine sanctuaries are a great secret weapon that we have in the fight against climate change, both to mitigate climate change, for example, through kelp, which absorbs huge amounts of excess carbon, and to also adapt us to climate change. Again, getting to the example of kelp, which helps buffer wave action, reduce erosion, uh, help us with regard to strong wave events, uh, weather events, uh, sea level rise, etc., and more on that later. Um, but that wasn't what was originally intended with the Sanctuaries Act, which was established in 1972. So in 1969, we had a horrible event happen in California, the Santa Barbara oil spill. Union Platform uh, A uh, had a rupture in the seafloor, and oil just gushed out. And this was the first time that the American public really got to see with something called television and the evening news, the tragedy that unfolded with the birds and the animals and the beaches fouled with oil and just the gushing oil that nobody could do anything about right. coming out of this rupture from the seafloor. And uh, it caused then President Nixon to take some temporary action, um, halted offshore oil, reviewed the situation, uh, also talking about the need for oil to power the economy. Um, the public noticed and the public uh, began to, uh, in their concern, contact members of Congress. And this came to a crescendo in 1972 when several things happened. Um, Congress passed a series of laws in response to this and other environmental disasters. They passed the Clean Air Act. They cla uh, passed the law that approved the EPA. They passed the Marine Sanctuaries Act, which we'll talk about, the Clean Water Act. Same time, California residents, voters, approved something called Proposition 20, which established the Coastal Act. Right. And that also arose. Of course, there had been grassroots movements uh, that had led up to this. Here in Santa Cruz County, for example, there had been a proposal to put a nuclear power plant at Davenport Landing. In Monterey County, there's a proposal for a deep water uh, port at Moss Landing. Um, and so people um, had organized around these issues. Mm -hmm. So the Marine Sanctuaries Act was established in 1972, and the idea was to protect strategic areas of ocean and Great Lakes waters that were under U.S. jurisdiction. So the Great Lakes, area 200, out to 200 miles off our coastline of the United States, and then other areas like the Eastern Islands, Pacific Islands that are under our, uh, our jurisdiction, et cetera. Um, the first a sanctuary was established on the East Coast. It was a one-mile uh, radius area around uh, an old um, Civil War ironclad called the USS Monitor that had sunk. And this was what we called a Maritime Heritage Act. So Maritime Heritage being history of maritime um, things such as shipwrecks. And today we also look at uh, Native American sacred objects, uh, sunken tumuls, things like this. Um, and then um, 
you were able to nominate areas and various agencies would nominate areas for marine sanctuary status. Monterey Bay was nominated several times. Uh, one time, uh, Reagan as governor of California knocked it off the list. Um, there were many other efforts. Finally, Leon Panetta introduced legislation in 1987, and then environmentalists like myself got involved, and we all worked together and built what we thought was a pretty good sanctuary. Um, you had the Greater Farallons, which was then Gulf of the Farallons to our north, um, that was initiated through then County Supervisor and later Member of Congress, later U.S. Senator Barbara Boxer. You have Cordell Bank Sanctuary, which is further offshore, has a beautiful bank, has diversity of wildlife, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary around the Channel Islands, Santa Barbara Channel, of course, there's offshore oil nearby. So today we have more than a dozen marine sanctuaries and marine national monuments that do these things. And the National Marine Sanctuaries Office, back in the... 2010 to 2013 decided to allow communities and groups and states to nominate areas that they thought were significant for marine sanctuary status. One of those nominations was the for the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. So this area would start at the southern boundary of Monterey Bay Sanctuary, which is actually uh, in Cambria. San Luis Obispo County, okay. yeah. um, so, so that would be south of uh, San Simeon, where the Hearst Castle is. This would stretch down to Point Conception in Santa Barbara County. It would be larger than Monterey Bay Sanctuary. Monterey Bay Sanctuary is 6,094 square miles. This sanctuary wow. would be 7,000 as proposed. And it was nominated by Fred Collins, who is chief and chair of the Northern Chumash Tribal Council. He passed away some years later. Um, before he passed away, he heard that Noah was very likely to um, give the green light to the sanctuary, which he was very pleased with. His daughter, Violet Sage Walker, is now chair of the council and chief and is carrying on the tradition of moving this forward. Their partners were the Surfrider Foundation, the Sierra Club, Santa Lucia Chapter, and others, EcoSlow organizations, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties, right. who cared about this. Now, there's some history here. Um, Monterey Bay and many other sites tried many times to get nominated and finally got marine sanctuary status. Monterey Bay got its status in 1992 uh, and at the time was the largest sanctuary in the country. In the process of designating Monterey Bay, there was a public hearing in Monterey at the Monterey Conference Center, and a planning official from San Luis Obispo named John Von Reese showed up and got in front of the room. He's very dramatic, and he said, I propose on behalf of the Board of Supervisors of San Luis Obispo County that you extend the boundary of this sanctuary south to include of all of San Luis Obispo County and the first few miles of, of Santa Barbara County down to Point Sal. That idea did not catch fire because the member of Congress from that time representing the area was from Bakersfield, supported offshore oil. Leon Panetta did introduce legislation at the time mm. to create a marine sanctuary for the Central Coast. That didn't go anywhere. But the history of this region, San Luis Obispo County and northern Santa Barbara County, started back in 1977 when, under the Sanctuaries Act, um, Morro Bay was nominated for sanctuary status, and we also had the Morro Bay Estuary, and later uh, that was expanded to include uh, San Luis Obispo County going into northern Santa Barbara County. Why is this important to people in Monterey Bay and, and Monterey, Santa Cruz counties? Because we have marine sanctuaries extending from um, Point Arena and Mendocino County going down to Cambria, which is a lot, and it's a good chunk of the California current. With Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, we'll be able to go all the way down to Channel Islands, and we'll be able to protect a portion of the Santa Barbara Channel. Some of that's still in offshore oil production, but we'll be able to protect a large portion of the coastline that needs it. There's some perennial upwelling in the region around San Luis Obispo, northern Santa Barbara County. You have another seamount down there, similar to Davidson Seamount, which is wow. up here. You have another canyon down there offshore called the Arguello Canyon. We have the Monterey Bay Canyon, which is deeper, of course, um, but it's a different feature. 
feature. And you have lots of migrating routes, gray whale, of course, blue whale, humpbacks, you have the sea otter range. So you would have that zone of protection. Now, when I say zone of protection, fishing is still allowed. Other activities occur. People surf. They you know, do activities in the water as they normally do. So it's not quite like a national park, but you have active management and resource protection. You can't drill for oil there. There will be offshore wind outside of these sanctuaries. um, And there'll be other activities there, but you have a staff. And you have a staff of these West Coast sanctuaries off California. And there's also one off uh, on the very northern tip of Washington State called the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. They work together on things like preventing ship strikes to whales. It's one of the causes of death of whales is running into a, having a cargo ship run into them or whale entanglements from marine debris and crab pots and the like. Um, Other things that they can work together. I'm working on something now called the vessel incident uh, working group uh, where several sanctuaries are looking at the problem of vessels that, Uh, run aground or become stalled or become derelict and and pose a threat to natural resources. A good example was over a decade ago, uh, a ship cracked up off of Long Marine Lab and posed a threat to the region there and the sanctuary had to respond to that and spend money to do that. Um, So you would have this management and... um, And that's federally funded, right? I mean, it's federal. The federal government. Federal yeah. government, and that's where a lot of the law comes from. But they also work in partnership with state and local governments. And that's the beauty of the Marine Sanctuary Act is when Trump was president and said he was going to undo a lot of the protections, I kind of said to myself, that's going to be really hard for him to do or his administration to do because there are so many interlocking pieces that have to be untangled, undone here. Yeah. So that's really good. And the the other thing is sanctuaries promote research. There's a huge research effort right now within the proposed Chumash area. It's headed up by Steve Palumbi of uh, Hopkins Marine Station and others are doing eDNA, which looks at, you know, DNA that's in the water column. All right. And they're working with tribal leaders to use traditional knowledge and indigenous first people's knowledge to inform that process. And that's one of the exciting things about Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary is the involvement of people who've been managing natural resources in this region for over 10,000 years. Yeah, and the Chumash, um, you know, they were they were coastal dwellers, and uh, they were you know they would harvest shellfish and they would ha- go fishing and they had fishing boats that they went out into the That's ocean right. with, and uh, they, you know, they made use of ocean resources as much as land resources for a really long time. So yeah, you know, as we are here at at K Squid, you know, we're broadcasting from the unceded land of the Awaswa speaking Yupi people. Right. They also engage in those activities, but they're they don't have any uh, descendants that we know of that survived, uh, you know, the colonial period. So Yeah. Um so it's really, you know, different to have that to have that as uh, a resource where there still is an indigenous population who has some of that, sto- some of those stories and some of that knowledge um, that's been inherited over thousands of years. So, and there are some of the elders for the Northern Chumash Tribal Council. If you follow their social media, would like to introduce you to Slow Guterres, for example, or Bonnie Williamson, or some of the others who, and one of them uh, was deeply involved with NOAA and the Marine Sanctuary Program and worked with Fred Collins hmm. on the initial nomination. And they do carry traditional knowledge with them, so they are able to carry these these threads. And why it's important to Monterey Bay residents is we, as I mentioned before, we have this continuous band of protection. And then we are informed by this traditional knowledge as well and what we're doing. I mean, we went for many years as, you know, myself included as environmentalists without being informed by that traditional knowledge. And looking back, we should have been, and we could have looked for that and sought it out. But it's here now and available and being offered up. And uh, Chumash and others are very, very good at this. So, and it'll be a good growing process for NOAA and for all the partners involved. Um, you know, it's it, it makes sense. And we have a lot to do. 
I mean, the ocean is a huge part of this planet. And it's a major feature. It controls weather. It influences weather. It's a major economic corridor. It produces food. Half of our oxygen comes from it, from plankton. Right. You know, and it's huge. And per- you know, we're we have a lot of um, migratory species in the water here, and they they migrate over large distances. And to have the continuity of that protection seems like it would be really important and could make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and this is, I mean, just anecdotally, you know, I see the the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary as a big success because I've witnessed a, a much higher uh, number of species that I see in the ocean in terms of otters, sea lions, elephant seals, whales. You know that when I first moved to this area, you know there were areas along the coast you say, "Oh, don't go there; the water is too polluted." Yeah, um, and you didn't see as many animals, and now you see a lot more. Yeah, um, and you can, and virtually everywhere along the coast is considered safe for for water recreation. So yeah. that's you know just as I say anecdotally, you can yeah. see that there's you know value has been delivered from that protection, and that and that anecdote gets backed up by um, actual hard numbers. Uh, one of the things sanctuaries do, I mentioned research and education, is they do something called a condition report mm. where they, every five to ten years, they'll take the temperature literally and figuratively, how is the resource doing? Elkhorn Slough, which is part of the sanctuary, although Moss Landing Harbor is not, for example. Um, you know, Davidson Seamount. How are all these different sub environments within Monterey Bay Sanctuary doing? How's the water quality doing? Mm-hmm. How it was with species doing? And the condition reports have come out doing well for a variety of factors. We do reduce, you know, working with agriculture, for example, reduce the nutrient load into the bay. Uh, we're able to work with cities and the county to reduce plastic pollution and save our shores and others to reduce pollution going into the bay. We're able to um, work with shipping and cargo companies and tanker companies to prevent oil spills, prevent collisions with whales, slow people down. Uh, During COVID, we had an issue with with backups outside of the um, outside of San Francisco Bay, which is in Monterey Bay Sanctuary. Sanctuary staff worked with the Coast Guard to ameliorate that. So these condition reports back up sort of that anecdotal story that you told about the water being better and things being better. And part of that also is education and public outreach. Individuals learn about this and get involved. Save Our Shores is a good example. They have their uh, coastal cleanup program. Um, You had a group of citizens work together to get Cowell Beach in Santa Cruz off of the dirtiest beaches list. They worked very hard for many years, a coalition, Sierra Club, Save the Waves, others, uh, city and county were involved in that. So this is all backed up by getting people involved. So citizen science, citizen activism is a very big part of this whole this whole picture. Yeah. If you're just tuning in, my guest is Dan Hayfley. He is uh, with the um, Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Yes. And formerly with uh, O'Neill Sea Odyssey, Save Our Shores, and other other environmental organizations that have worked hard for decades, literally, uh, to uh, protect our oceans and shoreline. Yeah. Um, one of the things um, you mentioned earlier, federal funding, the foundation, Monterey Bay Sanctuary Foundation, we people know us because last year we had the 30th anniversary gala, uh, which was a huge success. And we also ran a series of columns in the Santa Cruz Sentinel and Monterey Herald about the history of the sanctuary and the current condition of the sanctuary. And now the sanctuary superintendent, Dr. Lisa Vonig, is running a monthly um, article in the Sentinel and the Herald about the condition of Monterey Bay and different stories about protections that occur there and research that's being done there. Uh, there was a great one last month. The inaugural uh, column was on plastic pollution and what the sanctuary and partners are are doing about that. But back to the foundation is one of the things we do is raise funds. So we've been raising funds for whale disentanglement. Mm. is what we technically call it. So actually when a whale gets entangled, you don't just send volunteers out there on on a raft. You you send trained people out there because it's dangerous and tedious 
and precise work. And so people have to be trained and it's rigorous training and you have to have veterinarians involved and people and you have to have equipment and it costs money to do this. So we're, we've been raising funds for that. We've been working with our national foundation to look at gear innovation. So new types of crab gear that could prevent this sort of thing. It, it's expensive to do, but it's something that we've put time and money into the ocean protection council and fish and wildlife have been, uh, California fish and wildlife have been supporting these efforts. So we work to fill in the gaps of where funding isn't, as we know today, everything is underfunded. So right. we try to fill those gaps and with Chumash heritage national marine sanctuary, there'll be a foundation there as well to help people, to be able to assist um, uh, where the where the help is needed. Yeah, I want to. Um, you made reference to the health of the kelp forests. And, yeah, and their importance in as both a, a carbon sink, also in controlling wave action or yeah. mitigating wave action. Uh, we've seen you know news items. Most people who who follow this sort of thing have seen news items over the past couple of years about. Uh, areas where we have, you know, sea urchins have essentially destroyed the root structure and we've lost a lot of kelp. Right. And there, I know there's a relationship between the sea urchin population and the and the sea otter population. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. And sea otters do, there's different types of urchins and sea otters do have tastes and they do have individualized tastes. So, for example, um, in an area called Tinker's Reef off Monterey Peninsula, there is a group called the Giant Giant Kelp Restoration Project. It's run by a volunteer group of divers. Keith Roosterart is one. He is a member of the Sanctuary Advisory Council. He's an engineer by day, uh, and he uh, lives a normal life, and he likes to dive, and he and his friends have developed this very sophisticated uh, effort to restore kelp forest off the Monterey Peninsula by going after the urchin population, looking for po a, a possible market for these urchins, uh, for example, the particular type of urchin that they're running into. And the fact is that the kelp forest habitat, it, it, it's a biodiversity spot. I mean, you have rockfish, you have urchins, you have, you know, crabs, you have, of course, the sea otter plays a, a capstone role in all of this. They help manage the process. And, you know, again, the sea otter population is hovering around 3,000. It could be a lot better. It used to be a lot more than that. It's come back, but it needs to come back more. And part of the reason is it needs to manage the kelp forest better. So over the years, um, there have been efforts to monitor the health of the kelp around Monterey Bay, kelp watch.org mm -hmm. um, and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary under the leadership of Andrew DeVogelaire who is the research director there and Dr. Vonig who's the superintendent and Steve Lonhart one of the researchers working with a group of scientists called the Research Activities Panel it's been working with the sanctuary to guide them as the sanctuary looks at ways to restore kelp habitat it's called the Iconic Kelp Project and something the foundation, National Foundation, will be helping to raise funds for uh, so we can supplement because there isn't possibly enough to look into all this. So we want to do it with good science and do it with informed science. So you don't just say, let's restore that kelp forest there because it's a great place for us to go out, you know, and go diving or whatever. You want to do it in a strategic way that makes sense for the whole habitat, for the, not the whole habitat, but for the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So this is one part of the whole picture. Uh, the kelp forest, uh, even here in off Santa Cruz County are not once what they once used to be. And there's other factors. I mean, there are permits for people to harvest kelp. And yes, kelp does grow fast, but there are times of the year you don't see much of it out there. And um, right. they used to be much more of a robust feature. Yeah. And there's times of year when it seems to get, you know, dot, has some kind of a die off or attrition and it, it gets washed ashore and our beaches get covered with it. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we want to understand it, and we want to put it in the context of today, and that's what the science is about. And then, of course, traditional knowledge also. There's a lot of that there. And we need to uh, be able to – the foundation will help support these projects through funding. We also do – the foundation does some work on legislation. I mentioned the vessel uh, vessel incident problem with, with vessels that – 
uh, run aground or, you know, go dead or derelict and there isn't, the owners can't be responsible or don't have the resources to be responsible for any environmental damage that happens, the sanctuary winds up having to respond to these things. So we're working with, you know, our representatives in government to try to resolve some of these issues, provide some funding and some solutions. So that's what the foundation does. And that's the beauty, again, of adding Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary is you're filling in that gap of protection for an area. So you have this type of advocacy and ocean stewardship, if you will, <clears throat> running over a lot of California's coastline. Yeah, and an opportunity for that to become a much more unified um, arrangement. And as you said, you know, once once we learn lessons from the work that we're doing, because there's obviously more to know, for example, about that, that kelp ecology. Yeah. Um, those lessons can be shared to every, you know, all the marine sanctuaries on the coast here. So that's right. Yeah, that's right. And then around the country, the, the exciting thing I mentioned nominations and new sanctuaries, there are two proposed sanctuaries off, off of the Aleutian islands in Alaska. Now both tribally nominated. Great. I actually met with uh, the chief and a, a group from St. George, up in the Aleutian Islands, oh, about nine years ago now, down here at Sanctuary Exploration Center. And it's very exciting. There's a proposal for Marianas Trench, which is now a Marine National Monument, uh, the area around there, um, areas on the East Coast. And um, we just heard about the UN had a working group that came up with language for a high seas treaty. The high seas is everything in the ocean that's, that's outside beyond the, that 200 mile limit. Right. That's yeah. right. Wow. That's right. Everything beyond those those ec exclusive economic zone, 200 mile limits. And there's all kinds of dumping that happens out there. There's illegal practices that go on out there. Mm -hmm. So this will allow that one third of that area could become marine protected areas that you could um, do environmental assessments of the effects of, say, seabed mining or deep sea ocean mining, for example. Yeah. Um, and that will be huge. And then. That can work as a unit with these other marine protected areas. I mean, a good example is I was in the Galapagos about eight years ago, and one of the guides there told me that basically it's the Galapagos belonged to Ecuador, and they've the area, the ec exclusive economic zone around Galapagos is basically a large marine protected area, but just outside the boundaries, you have these fishing vessels waiting for these manta rays that are protected within mm. this area to stray outside there and then they get harvested. So you want to be able to have some more comprehensive measures in place to protect the biodiversity yeah, that's out there. Ver I know there are some treaties that deal with, with fishery management, but yeah. overall, you can. I, w I will generalize it. It seems out in international waters, fishing really isn't regulated pr very much. So, yeah. Um, Enforcement's very difficult. Uh, I was at a plastics pollution conference that NOAA had, and I was wound up sitting on a heading to the airport with somebody who worked for the European Union and is working on the dumping treaty hmm. in the high seas. He says, "Yeah, there's there's basically twenty of us, and we're overwhelmed, and we have no enforcement." Yeah, God, yeah. I can imagine twenty <laughs> for the whole, all the yeah. entire <laughs> yeah for the European <laughs> Union's participation in that treaty it's not enough yeah yeah and that's just one component you know i mean the pacific ocean would hold uh like three north americas or four packed together it's it's a lot of territory and it that's is. just one ocean it is so yeah amazing well we're going to take a really short break we'll be right back with dan hayfley right after this If you're just joining us, my guest is Dan Hafley. He is with the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary Foundation and, and a veteran of working on uh, environmental protection for the Central Coast. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here at KSQD. And congratulations to the station and to listeners who contributed to the uh, boosting listenership and expanding the signal by buying those licenses. So now the reach is into Monterey County. Public radio is on the move. Yeah, and we're going to be uh, diversifying our programming, too, because we'll be bringing in more people from these expanded regions to uh, uh 
do some of the programming here, so you'll be hearing more news as well from uh, those areas, from Salinas Valley, from Watsonville, Pajaro Valley area, and from Monterey Peninsula, because we'll have uh, an opportunity for more people in those areas to uh, address their local audience. Um, so we'll really, we'll, we're becoming regional. Yes. Is, <laughs> Fantastic. Well, congratulations. Yeah. When talking about the uh, Chumash Heritage area, you said it's, I think, seven, uh, roughly 7,000 square miles? 7,000 right? square miles. So if you look on a map, and um, it, there are various places if you Google Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary and hit images, and you'll get a map that comes up. It's a lot wider. Uh, so Monterey Bay Sanctuary, uh, basically you have... It goes 50 miles offshore as measured from that point in Moss Landing heading out offshore, whereas mm -hmm. a lot more of the Outer Continental Shelf is covered by a Chumash uh, Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. And this is, again, how the uh, sanctuary was nominated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the draft plan that we'll see coming out in the next several weeks, probably by the end of April, that the federal government will release may have some modifications to that. I hope not a lot of modifications to that. But basically, there's a lot of similarities in the feature for Monterey Bay. There's a deep underwater canyon called the Arguello Canyon. There's an area of perennial upwelling. So upwelling, for example, a good example is Davidson Seamount, an undersea mountain that's protected by Monterey Bay Sanctuary as of 2008. Um, when you have an undersea mountain, those cold, deep waters that are nutrient-rich hit the size of that mountains and move up. And that's why you have a lot of rich wildlife uh, mm. At the at top of the mountain, you have all the corals and everything, and then you have all the activity going on above the mountain as well. And, of course, heading to a Davidson Sea Mountain, Monterey Bay, the, the, the uh, happening upon the octopus garden, a thousand octopuses in deep water brooding females with eggs near warm water vents head scratcher, but great wow. opportunity for research. So similar characterizations could be had in Chumash. We don't know what's going on down there. Right. And, you know, when we think of marine sanctuaries, we were working on marine sanctuaries. Well, we were working on Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary back in the late 80s and early 90s. The goal was to prevent offshore oil. And, of course, with Chumash, it's the same goal. In fact, the coalition that was struck to proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. It was sparked by uh, a proposal by PG&E requested by the federal government to do sonic testing uh, uh -huh. for underwater earthquake faults. And such sonic testing would have mass, would significant casualties of marine life as a result. And that upset the fishing community, it upset the environmental community. Um, the, her the sanctuary uh, proposal came a few years after that. Fishing community was not on board with that proposal, by the way. There's op significant opposition, um, even though the sanctuary itself would not uh, prevent fishing. But as we found with Monterey Bay, it's a lot more than just preventing offshore oil. Sanctuaries provide research, education, and resource protection. And, of course, resource protection <clears throat> itself is not just preventing offshore oil. It's making sure that you have safe habitats that can thrive, making sure that there's measurable outcomes, making sure that uh, you have rules in place that are reasonable and protect those habitats and the wildlife that are there, making sure that people who wander out in the bay stay 100 yards away from whales and dolphins and sea otters and, you know, um, provide for a healthy uh, environment out there for all. The research component is fascinating. Monterey Bay Sanctuary Research Team, which is small, works with organizations like the Monterey Bay Research Aqu Aquarium Research Institute with their big vessels and their technology to be right. able to do great and other uh, institutions be able to do research. Similarly, uh, for Chumash Heritage, you'll have the Morro Bay Estuary. Uh, you'll have all kinds of opportunities for great research and discovery. 
of, of things that we were not aware of before working with traditional knowledge from First Peoples. So that will have great benefits and then will inform management decisions mm -hmm. on protecting whale species, protecting octopus species, protecting kelp forests, uh, protecting these features, uh, being able to have uh, data so that when you work with agricultural community to prevent nutrient rich runoff from flowing into the ocean, you'll have something to back that up with. And everybody gets on board with this. That's the beauty of it yeah. is that everybody wants to protect their environment. We're all in the same boat and we all see that. So, I mean, right. boat is probably an interesting analogy to use with regard to ocean. <laughs> good metaphor. <laughs> protection, but yeah, it's a good metaphor. And even, even the people who are concerned about Chumash Heritage Sanctuary, I think of ultimately we'll get on board and help help in the effort because everybody wants a great environment fishing community everybody right and the fishing community needs you know sustainable fishing they don't you know you we find so many particularly here in monterey bay so many of the fisher fisher folk are families and yes. you know if you're you know you're getting ready to retire and your son's getting into the business you want him to have a future and yes. so making it sustainable is really all about having a future uh, that that is, you know, a con continuity from from what we're doing now to what we're going to be doing in know, the future, twenty years from now. Yeah, and granted, it's a very tough business. It's tough business all around. I know people who go out and they go for several days, and they may or may not have crew, and they have to stay awake, and it's very dangerous work, yeah. and it's risky financially. It's expensive. Those permits are not cheap, and you want to be able to know that the business is going to work. And to their credit, I think the uh, the folks that are responsible have been very responsible in working with the the fishermen. And I think the the exact opposite is true. People have been working together well. But you know, a lot of this is going to be coming out in the draft plan. So, the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary was tapped for designation back in 2021, and the uh, Biden Harris administration decided. And NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, concurred, this is a good place. This is a strategic spot. We want to do this. Mm -hmm. So uh, initial public comments came in, and they were positive overwhelmingly. There was some opposition. Um, so now there's this draft that the, the Chuma, Northern Chumash Tribal Council presented to NOAA back in 2015 that is being, has been evaluated by NOAA staff, and they have been looking at activities that are proposed, like the proposed wind area, 399 square miles, which would be just west of the northern part of Chumash Heritage and the southern Monterey Bay sanctuaries, what the impacts will be there. And this draft plan will be made public, hopefully by the end of April, a matter of weeks. And the public will get to weigh in on that. And so listeners today, if you want to know how to get involved, one good way is to get online. When this happens, you'll see in the news and in social media that Chumash Heritage Plan has been released. Go take a look at it. And you as a citizen can make public comment and go online and type in your comments and they'll be considered. There'll be public meetings. Some of them will be virtual, some mm -hmm. in person probably. Go attend those meetings and, and make your voices heard. And there was a very robust response. The last series of public comments over 20, between 25,000 and 30,000 comments were received, unique comments. And we want to get that kind of response again because it's a public resource and people uh, have the right to provide their input and their concerns. And there may be things that aren't in the plan that should be there. There may mm -hmm. be things that shouldn't be in the plan and should be taken out. People can review it at a high level or detail if they want their choice and make those comments. Right. And then once that public comment period is over, then the NOAA staff will review that. And then Congress has a 90 day period to object to it. If somebody does, hmm. if they don't, then it'll go into effect hopefully by the end of 2024. Great. And historically it seems like if the Congress, if the representatives, um, in Congress from the location yes. are in favor of it, it usually gets a pass from everybody else. But yes. things have gotten really strange 
in, in U.S. Congress in the last several years. Do you think there's any risk that uh, Congress might uh, get in the way of, of the uh, sanctuary being established? I don't think so. Um, and again, I don't have a crystal ball, but going back to your earlier comment, so Representative Salud Carbajal Car- 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 has been the one who's been working on this, and he worked out the deal with the, the wind energy component, and he uh, was the one who really drove this effort for Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, working with then-Senators Kamala Harris and Dianne Feinstein, and later mm-hmm. uh, with Alex Padilla, Senator Alex Padilla and Dianne Feinstein, and Representative Carbajal is really been a champion of this and he has friends on both sides of the aisle so and then jimmy panetta now represents northern san luis obispo county right and he uh, he was himself a member of the monterey bay sanctuary advisory council and of course his father played a key role in the legislation uh for that so i think um i think that there's a very strong possibility that this will get through and get done um and It'll be good for the good for the country. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And this offshore wind lease is a separate thing. That is, the federal right. government has had opened up for um, uh, for bid right. this area that would lie outside of what's proposed for the uh, marine sanctuary. It's uh, so far offshore that the the uh, wind turbines would have to be floating. Yes, um, in, rather than actually sitting on the. Uh, on the seafloor. Yes. And, um, but obviously the cables for, for power and communication and all that would have to go through the sanctuary, right? So has, yeah. is there a, how does the plan address that? Yeah. So we'll see how the plan will address that. I mean, um, the wind companies have been, the folks who won the bids have, I'm sure, been in communication with Noah. With Noah. I mean, I think they would like to see <coughs> a free pass to bring their, power on shore. My view personally is that sanctuaries do provide for permits for things like uh, communication cables for Mm -hmm. AT&T and for international communications that lie on the seafloor. There are communication cables on the seafloor of Monterey Bay Sanctuary. There are cables that go down to the Mars Array operated by Mabari in Monterey Canyon. Mm -hmm. There's phone cables that go underneath and these are provided for by permit for the by the sanctuary. I think a similar process could be undertaken for these cables that would be used for bringing electrons on shore from these offshore wind uh, generators. Now there will be impacts from this, and I think those impacts will have to be mitigated, and th- those impacts will have to be studied, and the knowledge from that will have to be used, and could be used by the sanctuaries, both Monterey Bay and proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuaries. In fact, Violet Sage Walker, who is the chair of the Northern Chumash Tribal Council, did a great op-ed piece in the San Luis Obispo County Tribune uh, a couple months back, in which she said, she went on a trip with the California Energy Commission to visit um, wind farms in the North Sea up in Europe, oh, yeah. and noticed that there had been some, in, you know, there wasn't as much wildlife. And she had talked to some of the operators and some of the regulators, and found that there probably are impacts. And you would imagine there would be because there would be cabling to hold these platforms, tether them somehow to the seafloor. There's got to be that technology. I'm not an expert, but there has to be something there. So there will inevitably be some impacts. We're already having problems, for example, with wildlife such as whales uh, getting entangled and having uh, run-ins with ships um, that run through and the sanctuaries are addressing that. Similarly, this impact which will occur outside the sanctuary but these whales inhabit the whole area including the marine sanctuaries will have to be addressed yeah. and that will cost some money and that should come from the folks that are providing that are you know doing business out there as wind farms just as the offshore oil industry provided funding uh, in california for impacts of offshore oil development in fact some of the money that came from those funds Uh, years ago were used to study areas that later became Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and were used to justify that sanctuary, which prohibited offshore oil. So the money has to be used for the appropriate purposes. So that's something that the the tribal council supports. And I think the environmental community 
will um, need to look at these impacts and advocate for the wildlife and for the habitats. Yeah, clearly. Uh, we do need wind energy. Uh, right now, doing it in mass quantities uh, is something the administration wants to do, along with the California Energy Commission. There'll be impacts. We'll have to uh, uh, address those. Yeah, and there's always, you know, there's always onshore facilities and that transition, you know, anytime you bring anything from offshore to onshore, right? that's a pretty vulnerable zone. And yes. that's where, you know, both for the, the equipment, the cabling or whatever it is, um, and for the shore itself. So it's, that's usually where the, the design gets perhaps trickiest of all. Um, yes. It's right there at that transition point from the ocean to the land. So. And that would be Morro Bay, uh, which is where, you know, it's the old PG&E plant there no longer mm -hmm. belongs to PG&E, <clears throat> as I understand it, but the tran tran transmission lines are there. Mm -hmm. It won't be Diablo Canyon because Diablo Canyon <clears throat> will still be operating, uh, theoretically, when these wind energy systems will be online and generating power. Right. So Morro Bay is a small community. It's a it's a mighty community. It's a fishing community. It's a tourism community. This will be a new element. Yeah, it will. It'll be yeah. tricky. Yeah. Though. And somebody will, you know, some there will be some employment short term, but in the long term, it's just a, really a handful of jobs Yeah. Um, to manage that. Usually they're converting uh, voltage or from AC, from DC to AC or a combination of those things. Yeah. Uh, so there's always equipment to maintain, uh, but that's there, you know, that, that comes down to a pretty small crew once the system is yeah. built. So, yeah. And when those systems are built, that's going to be a massive operation that won't be happening out of Morro Bay. They'll be happening out of Los Angeles or San Francisco. You know, these are massive, I mean, you've seen wind turbines in Monterey County and uh, up at, you know, uh, going over 580, Altamont Pass. These may be larger. I'm not sure what these will look like, yeah. but there's going to be a lot of infrastructure. It's got to be put in place in an environment that's not the land. It's the ocean, and it's, uh, it's a dynamic environment. Yeah, and they, they put the very largest turbines made on those in these offshore platforms, so they're they're quite... They're quite large. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the yeah. kind of thing where you can't you can't fit the propeller on the back of a truck to take it down the road. They're that big. Yeah. So, uh, but they'll be shipping them out there instead. Yeah. So you're and you're going to have fishing going on. So fishing's going to be interrupted. Of course, whale migration routes and all of this, and you know whale migration routes happen to be within this near this area. They also happen to be near shipping areas. So this is something that's got to be managed and. The sanctuaries, the teams, which are small, mm -hmm. uh, are going to have to manage this. And they operate in a limited budget. So it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. And to come up with uh, the, the data that they need in order to define, you know, the parameters of what's, what's allowed is, is always, that's where the research comes in. Yeah. Because yeah. right now I think the only, I think the North Sea is the only place where there's been a sustained period of offshore wind development and any data that's that could be derived would probably come from there so we'd be producing unique data here yeah and there's also another wind area up off humboldt as well that's a i believe a larger area uh so california is providing its share of what the biden administration wants to see in terms of of uh <coughs> alternative energy development on a large scale yeah, I think there's a small uh, offshore farm at this point off of uh, um, Cape Cod, if I remember correctly, yeah. anyway, in New England. Yeah. Um, and that, but it's relatively small compared to these other, um, you know, ones that are under development now. So we're, you know, we're treading in new ground. Absolutely. Absolutely. What's well, the end ground occupied by lots of wildlife and birds? Yes. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah. So it raises issues, but obviously it's outside of the marine sanctuary that's proposed. So yeah. that's that's interesting, you know, to think in terms of having that uh, uh, corridor, as it were, down the coast that could be continuous with the addition of the Chumash Heritage Sanctuaries. Yeah, even though it's outside, as you point out. And most marine sanctuaries now, Monterey Bay was unique when it was established in 1992. It was the first one next to industrial industrial uses. Greater Farallons 
was really next to farmland, uh, mm. which has impacts, but not on the scale of something as a moss landing or a cement plant oh, as yeah. we had here. And then with Chumash, it'll be breaking new ground that way too. And we have industrial and human activity all over the place. And marine sanctuaries will contend with that. Um, you know, I mean, the oceans are busy places. Um, w- so with regard to the Chumash plan, so a good way for people who are listening to engage with this is Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. They have an account on Twitter. They have an account uh, on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, and they actually, I believe, have an account on LinkedIn. So you can follow them on social media. And now is a mm. good time to do that because the plan is going to be coming out soon. And uh, the Northern Chumash Tribal Council, Sierra Club, Surfrider, and others will be providing guidance to people when the public meetings are, what some of the points are. Uh, where, you know, what, what things to look for in the plan. The plan's going to be massive. I don't know if everybody's going to be able to read a, you know, 100-page doc. I don't know how long the document's going to be, but you to be able to know what to look for in the executive summary and uh, be able to talk to your neighbors about it. And we really want to get a large public response to this. And I think people in Monterey Bay need to be concerned about this because – Again, it would provide that continuous zone of protection. And, you know, San Luis Obispo County for many years, we had protection here, but they were still vulnerable to offshore oil. There were 67 offshore tracks uh, Mm. lying off of Morro Bay that industry was interested in because, after all, they are operating in Santa Barbara County still. There's still offshore oil development there. And um, now they'll have that protection. And uh, what happens in the California current off California coast, what happens on our ocean waters affects all of us. So I know that there are a lot of engaged listeners and it doesn't take a lot of time to engage in public comment. If you can't attend a meeting, if you can't even attend a virtual meeting, you uh, wait to speak, you can go online and write your own comments and, you know, give your own views of how this could work or not. So. Yeah. And, and that opportunity to engage, we, you know, we're, we so often get, you know, stuck in the sense of, you know, well, you, you know, they aren't listening or, or, uh, oh, well, I can't get out to that meeting or whatever. But there are so many opportunities now to s- submit comments, you know, online, yeah. um, submit, you know, participate in a meeting um, on Zoom or whatever, you know, medium they're using for that. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's not that difficult. You just have to know when it's coming up. And yeah. be ready. And be ready. And I'll tell you, um, the folks at NOAA that are working on this plan and the folks higher up at NOAA, these are very conscientious people. They're dedicated to public service. They believe in the mission of marine sanctuaries. And they do listen to the public comment. I've, I've noticed that very, and I've worked with them very closely over the past several years. And it makes a big difference. Uh, another thing I want to uh, just if people have their pencils ready, there is a website, Chumash Herit- uh, chumashsanctuary.org, and that's the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary's website. Proposed, that's Northern Ch- Chumash Tribal Council operates that website. And also you could go on to NOAA's site, their designation site. And if you go to my Lookout article, Lookout Santa Cruz article on Chumash, there's a link in that article that's embedded there. And you can go there, and it will also pop up. You know, the the public plan has just been released. You can get your copy here and make your public comments here. So it's pretty easy to do, and they are listening. Yeah, that's great. And you know, it's it is uh, unfortunate that we have you know in some cases appointees to uh, regulatory bodies who don't believe in the mission of those regulatory bodies. But I, I don't think that's happened to NOAA yet. No. But from what you're saying, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's not the case. The leadership is is first rate, and uh, they work hand-in-hand hand with the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and that's been that partnership has led to this drive to expand National Marine Sanctuaries, and which is a great thing. It yeah. really is. And yeah, as great. I mentioned and before— to have local— local organizations who are actually engaged in and and watching what's going on that's 
critical. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's a lot of experience. I mean, you know, the director of the Santa Lucia chapter of the Sierra Club, Andrew Christie, has been doing this for a very long time and knows, he knows the history, he knows the rules. And, you know, the folks at the Northern Chumash Tribal Council, very experienced people who know this stuff. So there's a lot of good knowledge and you can just reach out. That's but it's right. important to engage. It really is. We have an administration that listens. We have an agency that's listening. And marine sanctuaries, I think, are really our future. They're key to our, as I said before, and I'll say it again, fight climate change, protect biodiversity, protect our environment, protect the oxygen we breathe, protect that wildlife that's out there. And, um, you know, the other day we had a Pacific right whale uh, that was spotted. There's only, what, 30, over 30 individuals left uh, of this of this species, but what marine sanctuaries uh, and others can do is they can help create the conditions for species to continue to survive yeah. and possibly do better. Yeah, that's as that's Fred wonderful. Collins says. His daughter Violet says, Fred Collins, who uh, nominated Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, said, "It's not just sustainability; it's thriveability. Yeah. It's getting us back to that." Right. Well, may we all thrive. Yes. Well, we're out of time, and I want to thank you, Dan Hayfley, for for coming on the show. It's been great to have you. Thank you, Len. Appreciate that. Appreciate all you do.